Hey everybody, this is Carmen Rojas here with the Camel Jacket Chat, and it is a Wednesday. I saw that Mia Voss put out a post today, um, hashtag, what was it, Hangout Hump Day. So, hey, and I've got my camel jacket all ready too, and it's got a, a lovely picture of a camel on it, so um, shout out to her for that. Anyways. Um, today we are going to be talking about content and we've heard a lot and it's one of those things that constantly circles around Google Plus is you know and even when it's not the focus of the HOA it often comes up is the the value of having good content and then one of the questions that always seems to stump people is not just you know, we understand, we get it, we get the value of it, but how do you write it? How do you identify it? How do you make sure that the content that you have and you're putting out is worth people's time to read? So that's what the focus of today's show is going to be about. And I have asked my good friend and one of my favorite friendors, um, that's my, my own hashtag there, hashtag <laughs> friender, um, for my friends that are vendors of mine, uh, Miss Laura Williams, who has a new show that she's also going to be talking to us about. Um, and so we're going to spend some time talking about those things, and that's what the focus of today's show is. So I warned you before you came in here that you would need a pen and you would need some paper so that you can write down all the good notes that we're about to give out. So, hope you have your pen and paper ready because we're going to get going with this. So, Laura, why don't you, for those of you, for those who don't know you, and I really don't know who that would be, um, <laughs> let's go ahead and, and do an introduction so people get, get to know you a little better. Okay. Um, I'm Laura Williams of Good Inklings. That is my company where I do content writing, marketing, and social media for different clients. Um, I've, I write content for people all over the world um, in all different kinds of businesses from literally from dog groomers to uh, huge corporations. It just depends on what's asked of me. Um, I am starting my show tonight which we'll talk about later which is I'm very excited about and I just the thing that <laughs> the thing that um, as I go through reading content on the internet. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves is businesses that pay for pearl, poorly written content. They just think by saving money that they're doing themselves a service and it really isn't doing themselves a service. If um, they can't hire somebody in-house to write their content, they need to think about getting somebody. Because poor content is, it's, this is how I think about it. Your website is your car and that's going to get you from point A to point B. But how you operate that car is what really matters and your contents what actually operates the car. It's what drives it every day and keeps it in good shape. And if you're not taking care of that then um, you're not really taking care of your business, your online aspect of your business for sure. I agree. And I, I could I would take that a step further and say that, you know, your website is your car, but your content is kind of like the gas in the car. Yeah. I mean, if you mm -hmm. don't have good content, your 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 car, your website is not gonna go anywhere. It's just exactly. gonna sit there on cinder blocks in your proverbial driveway and nobody's gonna care about it. You know, no exactly. matter how cool it is, you know, you may pay somebody to design you this Lamborghini of a website and then you put crappy gas in it and it doesn't go anywhere. Right, and it's just like a car. If you don't, if you don't know how to work on your own car, you hire a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about that on your content on your website. And I'm not just saying it's not just that they hire poor people. Sometimes uh, business owners will try to do it themselves. And when you're a business owner, your focus is much different than your customer's focus. And what I mean by that is, you're writing to sell your business. You're writing to sell yourself. You're writing to sell your product. Whatever it is, you're trying to sell that your customer doesn't necessarily want to be sold. They need to be, get interested first. They need to start believing in you and your product, whatever you're offering, and build up some kind of trust relationship with you. If you have somebody outside writing that content, then that relationship is more apt to happen because they're looking at it differently. They're focusing more on the audience and what their needs are as opposed to what the business needs are. Yeah, I can, as a business owner myself, I can attest to that. And, you know, even writing, you know, even being someone that's good at this, you know, I have, or what I, what I hope is I'm good at this, um, you know, I've, I've got some certifications in content writing, and it is really tricky to, to, to think outside of yourself. 
you know, as the business owner, and you think I this is what I want people to know about my business. This is what I want people to know about me and all my certifications and degrees and all these lovely things. And that's not what makes people click. You know, that's not what makes people do what it is that I want them to do on my website. So having an outside person, at the very least, take a look at your content right. before it goes live. Um, yeah, because it's, very it affects the language and the tone. I mean, not just not just uh, your intent, but the language and tone. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, can be difficult for people in the content writing business, depending on what kind of content they're writing, like myself, I write for almost almost all my content either is mine or I'm writing for a business is to understand that business's tone. A good example, Carmen, is uh, I'm, just, I'm doing some web content for her for a website and it's a very specific specialized business with specific specialized terminology mm -hmm. and it is difficult to sometimes get the right language in your head around that. That's one of the arts that makes a good content writer is being able to move from the cutesy dog groomer type content, you know, about how to take care of your dog, why you should get your dog's nails, trims, or whatever, to really serious, um, like I said, specific type content. You have to be able to kind of go with the flow and know which customers are looking for different types of content. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, now, one thing that I was I was going to ask you about how and and I think this is one of those key things that we have to identify and be very specific about first. And when we talk, and, and it's it's not that I don't know the answer to this, but I want to make sure everybody understands when we talk about content specifically. What is that? Because in your opinion, because it's not okay. just text, it's not just the words. Yeah. And I think sometimes people make that mistake. No, it's the whole, it's everything, to me, it's the images, videos, um, references, links, it is, even the formatting of how it looks, how it lays out on a page, all of that is, to me, content. That, a, a badly formatted page is going to make me click away as fast as, uh, you know, really bad graphics or something, but it's, all of that to me is content. It's the whole package. Good. So did when people, go ahead. Did that answer that? I think so. I think, um, and I'll leave that to the audience to to say if, if they still have more questions about that, about defining what tip. What when we talk about content, and I think that you know, depending on who you're listening to, they may define it a little bit differently. Um, but I do think people need to get the bottom line fact that content is more than just text. It's more than just the words. It's, it does include images, videos, um, all of that kind of stuff on the, on the site. And when we, when, I know when we talk about content with our clients, and I think you would, you would agree with me um, just on the calls you've shared with me, is that I like to use the analogy of a house that's being put together. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the site itself is kind of the framework of the house. The right. content is what makes the house look pretty. It's things, you know, it would be the, the carpet and the walls and tile on the floor and the granite countertops and all of that kind of stuff. That's the that's what content is for your website or for your brand, you know, and your presence on right. the internet is that that's what content does. You do have to have the right structure. Um, you know, and that's important if, you know, and it's just like in a house, you know, if there's no door to the room, it doesn't matter how pretty the room is. So you do Absolutely. Need, so you yeah. do need to have the right structure and flow for your um, you know for your site or for your presence but at the end of the day the content is what makes it look pretty and what makes it look like you here's another layer to that it's also the street that you live on because depending just like a house different different houses on different streets have different type of architectural structure because of the neighborhood so that they can fit into that neighborhood Mm -hmm. And content is the same thing. You have to know how the mechanics of it. The way I write a Google Plus post is completely different to the way I'd write a press release or mm -hmm. the way I would structure web copy. There's a lot of different, because there are so many variations to content, I think that's sometimes part of people have trouble getting their head around that. When I write, my content includes writing brochures for people, writing websites, uh, blog posts, um, um, social media posts, press releases, anything, any kind of place that my written words on is some type of content because whether it's driving on the internet or driving through your neighborhood, it's still content. Yes. Yeah. 
that's that's one thing that I you know you have I, I don't want to disparage anybody and I don't mean to but you have a lot of people jumping on the content writing uh, bandwagon but they're not taking the time to go back and learn the different formulas formats for uh, different types of writing so that yeah. being said yeah I agree, and you and I, when we were putting this show together, um, brought up a really good point that I definitely want to share. And th I think one of the first steps people need to take with identifying, you know, how to write good content, which is what we're trying to do here, is to understand what's the purpose of your content. Exactly, you have to know what your are intention. You Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Strategically, you know, your website has a purpose. Your website is there to sell something. It's there to collect sign-ups. It's there to do something. And then what role do you want the content to play in that? And that's the, you know, the first thing that I think people need to, to understand. What, would, what, what do you think about that? No, absolutely, because if you're writing for a motorcycle manufacturer or you're writing for a company that produces wine, you're going to write, you have to write differently for each of those. Those are completely different sides of the spectrum. So you have to be able to tailor the content to that. So you have to know who your audience is, and you have to know what your purpose is. Is your purpose to drive more traffic to the website? Is your purpose to drive them to Amazon, you know, to buy a book or something? What is your real purpose? Some people's purpose is just to make themselves sound like an expert, let's say a dentist or something like that. He necessarily doesn't want more website traffic as much as he wants to be considered an expert. Mm -hmm. So there, there's different ways of doing that. Well, and one example um, that I'll share, we were um, kind of specking an, a project a, a little while ago to for a company that, you know, they needed a website, but their, their business driver was that they, you know, submitted bids to government contracts, um, and, you know, so they wanted a website. And so when we, when we talked about what do we want the site to do, you know, he had his long kind of laundry list of things, and I said, okay, but wait, where is this traffic coming from? You know, and so when we got down to it, it was people who had seen his form submission and were going to then come to the website to kind of verify that, you know, all of this stuff was, was good. So for that particular situation, you know, no, nobody Google searches this, this business. You know what I mean? It's, so the focus of the content for that is very different than, say, you know, a, a commercial or, you know, a B2B type of a company where people really are Google searching more often. And so your page rank and all of that fun mm -hmm. stuff becomes much, much more important than a site where people are just trying to make sure that you are who you are and that you actually have proof of what you said you put down in your in your application. Right, right. Yep, and I mean the thing is that you have to work, like you have to know your audience, but you also have to work to get noticed. Um, one of the first places that you could do that is to work on uh, headlines. Get, um, I lost you there. <laughs> um, to get okay. strong. Okay, to get strong headlines, to make, I'm sorry, to build strong headlines, there's a wonderful article, um, blog post by Upworthy that I'll put into the notes after the show, but building a strong headline is the first thing you need to do because that needs to attract attention, it needs to tell what the basic content is about and basically why somebody should listen to it. And this is probably going to start some type of storm of controversy, but I'm going to say it. I personally, <laughs> I personally am getting tired of five steps to this, ten ways you can do this, three ways to do this. I have been turned off by that kind of content lately. I just I don't even click to read it unless it's from somebody that I really, really want to read from. And I know it's a great headline catcher, but I really want headlines to be a little more specific because there's so, let's say content writing, there are so many articles out there that say the five steps to great content, the oh, yeah. ten steps to great content. It doesn't even, I don't even hear it anymore. I don't even hear it anymore. And most of the time those articles are just bare bone facts. Anybody can make a list like that. Well, and I think that kind of speaks to, you know, again, how do we qualify good content? Um, and and one, of my, one of my more favorite analogies, um, and I'm, I'm a big Guy Kawasaki fan, but he talks about having businesses that are unique and valuable. And I think it's the same thing with content. You know, Absolutely. When, and he talks about, you know, the four quadrants and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and if your content is unique and valuable, then the headline 
should just go with the content. You know what I mean? But I think people do it backwards, and they write a, a headline thinking that that's what's going to grab clicks, yeah. and then they write the story to fit the headline that grabs the clicks, and that's completely reverse. Yeah, it absolutely um, is. It, one of my, my favorite, favorite, favorite on, online writers is Mike Alton, and the reason is I, I don't even recall when I have clicked on something his, it did not hold some value. And I, I mean that sincerely. I'm not saying it because I like Mike, which I do, but I really do believe. And the thing is, it doesn't. It, it it was important to me. Um, before, when like well on Google Plus, when I first started Google Plus and didn't have a clue what the heck was going on, as it is today, when I feel I have a really good grasp on it, it still is important. Every article offers something. From for the beginner all the way up to somebody who really you know kind of knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. and that's in a major talent. I have, I mean, I bow down to Mike Alton. He's 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 awesome. So yeah, right. <laughs> if Mike's out there, you know we we don't. We love Mike. Um, Mike is actually coming on the show later this summer. We, we were able to get him um, you know, to, to sit still for just a few moments so that we awesome. could get to hear from him. And, and I swear, you know, it's funny. I think Mia Voss likes to tease him a little bit that he can write a blog in about five seconds. And, and I don't know how he does it, but he does. Yeah, um, and, he, and his blogs are so... I, you can also tell when you hear him talk, too. He talks much like he writes. And I think that's another key to good content is keep it real. Mm -hmm. If you start to move too far in any direction to where you're out of your element on your writing, it's going to show. You know, if oh, yeah. I tried to write, write in a really cool, funky, relaxed way, if it's very short, I might get away with it, but if, it, if it's, you know, any kind of link to it, no, because I'm not cool and funky. I'm, I'm 51 years old. <laughs> You know, I couldn't You're get cool. away. You're cool. You're still cool. But you know what I mean. And if I, if if you had not had a good background in business and you tried to write in more specific business manners, that matters. I'm sorry. That's going to show up. So you have to kind of make sure you stay a little bit in your wheelhouse. I'm not saying don't go out of it. That's how you learn. But you know, center it in your wheelhouse. And the other thing, content has to do two things that are really important. It has to ask questions and it has to answer questions. Right. That, right. That's key. You can't just write, and we've all seen this, where somebody just writes a bunch of stuff down on a piece of paper, but there's no real direction. You have to direct your reader, and the way you do that is by asking and answering questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are just about 15 minutes into it. I've seen um, a few people in the room. I know I'm kind of clicking out. For some reason, Comment Tracker doesn't seem to want to be showing me everybody's everything, so hey. It's, it's it's Google. What are we gonna do? Um, but one comment from the room that I when I went back out and look um, is from Miss Tanya Rufus, who said she I was told that bullet lists are what people preferred to read, quick, easy, and to the point for busy people. Um, and I, I'll let Laura comment on that as well. But I think bullet lists help. Um, I think they you know they they bring the eye to the attention. You know what I mean of what it is that you're trying to say. Um, I do it fairly frequently. You know, I, I tend to, you know, I don't know if I necessarily do the, the five things that whatever, whatever all the time, but I do tend to like to give numbers um, because I think people skim a lot. Mm -hmm. And so if they can find the salient points when they skim and they see one, two, three, oh, there's a comment. It is. It's just being a little slow today. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that really does help. So, you know, go ahead and, and comment on that. What do you think, Laura? I do agree. Of course, that, like, you know, that is indicative of what kind of content you're writing. But um, I do agree with that. If, it, if it's, a, let's, say, let's say if you're writing um, for a dentist office and you're writing about how important it is for your kids to get dental checkups and that summertime's a great time for that to happen, that's a great place to put a bullet list. Because that's the type of reader that, it, that that is. They're going to skim that. They're not really interested in the meat and bones of the article. If you are writing on something more specific, like, um, um, oh, I'm trying to think of something specific, and I can't specifically think of anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know, right? If you were, okay, for example, if you were writing on Panda 4.0, Right. Okay. You would want to break up the page so that 
it looks like it's chunky bits of information, but there's a lot of it, information in there. But ne not necessarily bullet points because the people that are reading that are more interested in the meat and bones. Does that make sense? So I think everything, they both have its place. But yeah, for standard content that people are just skimming through for products or services, things like that, bullet points work pretty awesome. How to do lists, to do lists are big. And they should be. Because, I mean, where do we all go when we need to learn how to do something? We go right. to Google, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I, and I think, you know, uh, basically, you know, what a bullet list is trying to do is trying to, you know, catch your eye. And there are lots of good ways you can do that. So even if you don't want to do the, the tiny little bullet, images are a great way to do that. Exactly. Um, you know, to, to really pull a point home. And I'm sorry, I have a little pet today that <laughs> is being really obnoxious. Very needy. <laughs> he is. And, and it's either that or have the audio in the background of him acting like a dog. I got lucky. My cat's asleep. I should have yeah. said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways, the you know using things like the images. You know, if you have a really strong point, stick an image right there. You know, we've heard all about Canva and how easy it is to create little quick images. That's a great way to draw people's eye sure. to what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> you know, and then other things that that help um, using bold text. You know, or yep. changing the changing the size of the font when you're or making a really or the mm -hmm. color um, when you're making a really strong statement. So even if it's not necessarily a bullet list, um, you know, just a tri little tips like that to kind of help steer the eye where you want it to go can be really yep. helpful. And I have to give a shout out. This is too cute. <laughs> <laughs> That is too much. That's hilarious, that's Kevin. Thank you so much. Little dog drive by hashtag. <laughs> yep, that that's what happens around here. He just decides he, you know, he's almost like a cat. I don't know what's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And uh, the other thing, uh, Carmen and I were talking about this. I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, but it was about numbers. And yeah. um, this is this is something you know that. You have to have a pretty good relationship with your client if you're writing for somebody to get them to understand that content is can bring up, um, you know, hits to your website and all that. But depending on what they are trying to do, maybe that's not the numbers that they're looking for. But what I'm getting at is I think that when you're writing content for someone, you need to look at the total numbers and not get so hung up on the little ones. Like Carmen and I were talking, I had recently had a post that still, I don't even know what's going on with this thing. It's, it's still blowing up. And this was just a post I wrote randomly, had nothing to do really with anything that I was doing. So that's kind of how content works. Some things are just going to hit the right day at the right time and others aren't that you may think are more valuable. So you just have to keep writing content and keep putting it out there and you're going to get results. Great. You know, and one thing that I think I would recommend for new people, you know, who are new to writing content and all of that is that um, you do it is a little bit of a trial and error within your niche. Mm -hmm. Um, th as much as I wish I could give somebody a list of what will work in every situation, every type of industry, every vertical, you know, if I could do that, I would be making a lot more money and yeah, probably wouldn't would. be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> and the, you know, and the, there's a very good reason why that doesn't work because every business is different. You know, if well, they should be. If your business is identical to somebody else's, I really don't know why you're in business, unless you know, even franchises have different locations. Right. Um, you know, so if you're, you know, so there's really not a good way to tell because your business is different, your tar your mo your audience is a little bit different, um, your 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 business strategy is different, so your content should reflect that, and that's why there isn't a, a master list of you know a checklist that works for every single case every single blog every single right. social media post yeah and another thing is you have to listen listen not just to your your uh, client your customers and everything but listen to the online world because you want to stay current on things so if you have a chance to newsjack um, newsjacking is when you kind of jump on the train of something that is uh, happening. If you have a chance to newsjack somebody else's story with your content, you have to be able to listen. So let's say if um, um, what has happened? Oh, the VA. 
let's say the, v, the situation with the VA. The company that you're working for provided some type of military, um, a service to military families. Maybe it's a moving company or something like that. You need to be able to know what's going on because you don't want to put anything, a content that either disparages the, the sane voice in a situation like that or, you know, in some way conflicts. And also, you may be able to use something from that situation to help move what you're moving. You know what I mean? You yeah. have to be tasteful about it, though. I mean, there was a, there was an article I was reading today. I don't even remember where I read it today, so I, I, I'm going to quote it really, really loosely. But it was a company that, oh, you know what it was? It was a company that had um, a big recall on beef. Mm -hmm. So their social marketing department had automated all these posts and these posts went out and one of them said make hay while the sun rises which doesn't sound like a big deal but it was not a good idea when they're in the middle of this big controversy that had just broke do you know it, yeah. and it sounds it you have to really kind of think through things on the other hand there's been some wonderful there's a book that I have called newsjacking that I suggest any content writer read but there's um there's also stories that people have taken just a small a story um, about a famous wedding or something like that and a problem that happened there. I don't remember what it was, but and just taken off with that. So you have to be aware of what's going on around you. Absolutely. And that way you come up with good content ideas, but also you know what to write about, what not to write about. Or just what might be a potential minefield to walk into. Right. And it happens all the time. We see it all the time. Social media, where big brands get caught, you know, with their pants down, so to speak. You mm -hmm. have to, you have to take that into consideration. Yeah, you know, and I, I, and I really think that you know, there's a lot of um, information and 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 directives given about how to write content, how to do different things um, with content, and it's written you know using evidence of what worked for big businesses and yeah. that's not the kind of content or strategies that work for small businesses um, exactly. and particularly for businesses that are in the early startup stages um, that was one of the reasons why as a focus our business we got into entrepreneurial marketing because it really is different um, you know the kind of content that you have to write when you have when there's no trust of you or your brand is different than the content you would write if you've been in business for 50 years and have m millions of customers around the world. Exactly. Uh, you know, there's another thing. I was downtown yesterday. Um, I live in a social media Sahara desert. Just so you know, <laughs> these people might do Facebook, and that's just for friends and family. I mean, I have a Facebook business, Facebook account for this area, and it's just uh, appalling the lack of business things I see on it. But I was downtown talking to a friend of mine that owns a bakery right down the street. She's just the sweetest lady. But she was te telling me that she would like to get more involved with social media. She has a Facebook account. And yes, because she is a very local business and that's the only thing we have, of course she should have a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. She said, well, what about Twitter? And I said, I don't feel that Twitter is really going to do anything for you because nobody uses it. And I said, but have you used Pinterest? She's like, no. So I said, okay, I'll come down here and I'll show you what to do. But that's content too, because you're you're not you're putting up the picture. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just a picture. But in that description, you write the content that will give your hashtags, give your keywords, whatever, that will help move that um, picture. And I think that uh, content writers need to look at those things. It's not just about the writing big articles. There's a lot of different ways that you can move uh, written content. Okay, that's those are great points, and I want to bring in a comment from Kevin Burns, who who's apparently liking my little dog, but he <laughs> has a great content, a great question that I think we could um, try to answer. Do you have examples of content you've generated for your businesses? The term writing content is new to me, um, and I think you know we we talked about it a little bit earlier in terms of what writing content is. Um, okay. but you know what I, what we could do Kevin um, I will I can send out some of the some of like my favorite blogs that I've written um, and not just necessarily because they were you know high ranking or you know got a bunch of clicks or comments or anything right. like that but you know some of the ones that I felt were 
captured what I was trying to say. They were well written um, and and were in line with the brand. And and that's the thing that I try to keep in mind when I write, um, you know, for my website and all of that is that I want things that are in line with the brand that are, um, you know, I got off my chest what I wanted to say. And if that doesn't, if Google doesn't like that, if it doesn't get me a whole bunch of clicks, that's okay. I, you know, it's it's really okay because I do think that people will find it eventually and to and get the value in it. That's true, and but and there's the other end of that that, and I'm sure you've done this. I've there's some um, websites that I've gone to, some pretty prominent people, that from the first word to the last word, you feel like you're being sold to. Hate that. You know, I mean, it just it's so irritating to me. There's absolutely no value of that to me. So I don't go through and look at whatever program or whatever book they're trying to sell, okay, because I. Go ahead. <laughs> You know, I, I need more than that as a consumer. Um, he was also saying about the content. What kind of content? I mean, see, that's a problem with it. Content writing is such a broad um, spectrum. It depends on. What, I'd have to kind of, you know, Kevin. If you want, if you want, I will uh, contact you and I get a clearer idea of uh, what you're asking specifically. Specifically, because it sounds like you have something specific that you're you're trying to get an answer to. There we go. That's what we do. We help people out. We answer questions. <laughs> if you can, you know, if it goes offline, then that's great. Um, and yeah. you're going to get some one-on-one -on -one attention, Kevin. It sounds like so. Score one for Kevin Burns. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that that. I sometimes I think is easier, you know, when we talk about building websites or content or whatever, we usually, what I'll tell my clients, I say, can you send me examples of content or websites that you like? And it takes them forever, and they can never do it. So, it, well, I'm not going to say they can never do it, but it's it's much harder for them to say, can you send me pictures of websites you don't like? or content you don't enjoy reading or would never click on again? And, oh, they send me tons of that. Isn't that funny how that works? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I want to talk about maybe some more of the don'ts with content um, that that can help people out to understand. You know, sometimes if you figure out where you don't go, you can figure out what you should do. Sure. Um, don't sound arrogant. That's the first one. You know, I mean, really, be friendly. Even if you're, even if you are writing for an attorney or something, be be friendly with it. Don't sound like a uh, know-it-all. People don't like that. Um, what else? Don't. Uh, oh, make sure you check your sources. Make mm -hmm. sure you really vet your sources. Don't just randomly pick things and include them in your article without reading them first and making sure that uh, that person that you're quoting knows what they're talking about, because that can that can backfire on you pretty big. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'll share one of my personal pet peeves with that I'm seeing a lot of. And, you know, I I really like, again, and I, it's a Guy Kawasaki product, and it's all top. And it curates all of this content, um, you know, and you can go and click on blogs and postings and whatnot. But what I'm finding a lot more of is it's almost like they're posting links to sites that are working like another all top like it's taking four clicks right. to get to the How actual blog is it is mm -hmm. and that drives me nuts yeah. i'm like i don't i i respect guy and and all top and i and i understand why they do it that way but when it's click you know he he runs the headline so you click on the head you know you click on the headline then you get to the page his page that says hey if you, you know here's a summary if you want to read more click here so you click there then you get to that page where it's another summary and they're saying if you want to see the original blog post click over here and it's just like really <laughs> so I guess yep. my point is make it easy for people to get to what they want. Um, you know, that's that's one of the things that I know I click off of, of content, it, whether it's your website, your blog, your social media, whatever. If you make me have to jump through a bunch of different hoops, walk through some fiery doors, and crawl over coals to get to the your point, I'm not going to read it. No, I absolutely agree with that. Absolutely agree with that. Um, another one is make sure that you uh, edit. Make sure you really check your spelling and your grammar. I, um, I'm sometimes good at that, sometimes not. I and need somebody else to read mine a lot of the time. That's what I, yeah, that's what I do a lot of times. And if, um, if I moved up into a different level, <clears throat> I probably, like, uh, 
writing a book or something, I definitely have an editor. I wouldn't just bring oh, it on yeah. my own. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's keep, a keep talking for one second. Sure. Um, also, um, make make it easy easy on whoever's reading. If you're writing it online, make sure your links go where they're supposed to. Make sure that um, uh, the writing is easy to read. That you don't use crazy fonts that people can't read or crazy colors that people can't read. Um, and when you take your content and you move it out into the world, if that's what you're doing, instead of it just being on your website, do it with some originality. Don't just keep putting the same post, same information over and over. Say it differently depending on where you're putting it. Um, what else? Um, the uh, um, what else was I going to say? There was something I was really thinking about. It'll come back to you. No, it's gone. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> oh, I know what it was. It'll come back. I wanted to address um, search engine optimization and keywording. That's a good one. Go for it. I can almost tell every time when somebody is writing to the keywords. And what I mean by that is they have the keywords in their mind before they start writing and they do all the writing centered around those keywords. I do the exact opposite. I write first, then I decide what my keywords are, and then I go back and rewrite for those keywords. Mm -hmm. Because it ends up with a more natural product. If you're writing just because for, the, for those two or three keywords that you've decided on, it st starts to sound like you're being slammed with it. Mm -hmm. if, if you do it the other way, it ends up, I think, more natural. I still get the SEO that I want, but I do it in a more natural manner. And I mean, there are some times, depending on what I'm writing, that I may not even give a consideration to the keywords. It just depends on what it is. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think some people get SEO happy sometimes, and it's like every other word is the, the keyword. And it's just like, yeah. whoa, can we? can't we? do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, calm down. It, that, that, that makes it, I mean, it, again, you just, you kind of sold yourself out as to well, what it is that you're trying to do. The big dogs are now saying that when you write for businesses, and I'm going to use that specifically because that is different than writing for yourself. When you write for businesses, you want to write for originality. You want to write for um, with just one or two keywords. And you want to write in a natural manner. So in other words, it's not real stilted. You know, if you look at back at some of the... Um, web copy for businesses, let's say five years ago. It's some of it's horrendous. Horrendous, particularly by today's standards, because they were using black hat SEO and they were keyword stuffing and just really not paying attention to the content itself. Now, um, if you listen to people like David Amerlin and Semantic Search, it, it's about the, it's about building the trust and the relationship and pro providing original good content that matters to people, that people want to read because they're invested in the relationship with uh, you or your product. Absolutely. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, one of the, the fun things that we like to remind people of when, they, when we build websites and things like that is that, you know, all a website is is pixels. All content is all of that fun stuff. Those those are pixels. It's you know it's it's a digital signal. That's all it is. Right. But you got to remember what you want are people. Yep. You have You're, to have the personality. It has to, it has to have a personality. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's not you can't be robotic about it. It's not. And that's why it's just kind of sometimes. It's not hit and miss, but it's not all. You're not always going to see the same. Um, correlation between your content and hits and visits and views and bounces and all of that fun stuff. You know, you'll I, I hear it all the time from people that'll say, you know, I posted about this one week. I, I I did exactly what you told me to, and I got a ton of hits. So I did it the next week. I did you know something similar, and I didn't get any. What happened? And it can be anything. I mean, it could be. You know, the thing. This is such. This is such a volatile business because. When you put out a piece of content, unless you do it the right way, which is you put it across several different platforms and you put it out multiple times, um, like Mike Alton's always saying, you know, don't forget about the international market too. But when, when you when you take that piece of content and you put it out there and you just put it out on a Tuesday at four o'clock and leave it laying there, 
Well, you better hope that people are looking at their computer Tuesday at 4 o'clock and be on your site specifically trying to find that content. Do you know what I mean? You have, you, have to be fluctu you have to fluctuate. You have to take into account holidays. You have to take into account um, uh, if there's a big news event coming on, you know, something, something huge is helping. People are going to be watching their TVs or they're going to be looking at news sites. They're not necessarily going to be looking at your content for uh, this great article that you wrote on dog grooming. You don't have to take all that into consideration. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're a little bit past the halfway point, so I did just want to remind everybody that you are watching the Camel Jacket Chat HOA here on Google+. And um, you're, you could be also looking at this at uh, our website, www.rojasconsulting.net backslash webcasts, which is where this is also um catching a live stream there or you could be watching us on YouTube with the replay we're so thankful to you for in, for watching us and enjoying today's show um, and looking forward to hearing all of your lovely comments and feedback um, on the the comment scroll there so if you have any questions or concerns or disagree completely with what we're saying I'd love to hear that you know I, I don't mind a heckler every so often so go ahead um, and and leave that there. And speaking of you know a disagreement, um, I did want to you know talk just a, a real quickly because I really liked um, Ryan Hanley had a hangout not long ago um, it was last week I believe where he had two guys on that were talking about content curation and they were mm -hmm. kind of you know debating back and forth different points about content creation and not trying to pick a fight with Laura at all. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are about content curation. Um, which is a little bit different than content writing, but we'll I go think, ahead and, and I talk think about there's it. a place. I think there's definitely a place for it. I do it myself because, um, particularly if I'm doing it for a client, I'll mix it with original content and other people's contents. But I try to do it in a creative way. But here's the big key to that: if you're going to use other people's content, read what they wrote. Make sure that you use it in the right context. And pay, pay attention to what it says and make sure it's, it's of value to the person that's going to click on it. Don't just put things up there because they have a great headline. It, it's not fair to the person that you're asking to click on that. If you're trying to build up a customer base, it's not fair to them that you give them content that they can't, uh, they won't enjoy or get any value out of. Oh yeah, and I, you know, and sometimes you'll find headlines that are intentionally cheeky, or they're being sarcastic, or you know, whatever. And because you didn't read the whole, you know, the body of what the 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 posting was about, right. you don't know that, and so you yeah. end up just kind of title surfing and um, posting and things good. Yep. This that morning, are inconsistent with your brand. Mm -hmm. This morning I came across one it was a great headline, it sounded like it was going to be interesting. I clicked on it, and went right into a product. Now, if I had not read that, if I had not clicked on it to find out what it was, I would have posted that for a client, and it would have been absolutely worthless to them. You know, it's it's a value. My client, I I promise my clients a certain amount of value, and that's not value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely not. And before we go, oh, go ahead. ahead. I was gonna say, are are we going soon? <laughs> okay, never mind. I was just gonna plug my show because I'm excited. Okay, no worries. I'll make sure we get time for yeah. that. But I did two things, and then we'll do, we'll talk about your okay. show. Um, one thing I was going to mention, and we kind of touched on it at the beginning, but I wanted to come back to it because it relates a little bit to a question that I have pinned, which is my second point. Um, just because you know how to structure a sentence, for example, you've graduated from high school, you know, maybe you have some college under your belt, you can physically write. You know what I mean? That's and, and maybe what you write is not bad. You know, you can write a letter, you can write a shopping list, you can write. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can write content. There really is a bit of an art and, you know, some some finesse, so to speak, to being able to write content. And it's different than journalism writing. You know, writing right. stories for a news broadcast is a different kind of writing. Writing it's, for you have to know how to tell a story. I mean, you have to you have to think about it that way. Um, Carolyn Capern, one of her taglines is that she's a storyteller, and that's how she drives her marketing business is as a storyteller. And that's what I think that that uh, people who are interested in content writing or writing their own content need to understand. It's not like a journalistic um, article where you're just throwing facts out there. I mean, it can be at times, but really, you want to tell your product story. 
or your service right. story or your story or or other people's stories but it needs to be in that in that context well and here's just my my second point and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about the show um, his question is and, I, and I'm paraphrasing a bit so Kevin feel free to correct us if we're we're paraphrasing incorrectly but he wants to understand what what is what should they be looking for in the skill sets of someone who's going to write content um, it looks like he's perhaps considering um, maybe hiring somebody or something like that and wants to know um, what kind of a background would it be and you know the uh, and I'll answer briefly and then allow Laura to get in there because I think that'd be a great um, opportunity the reason why that I, I you know like for example I, I do know how to write content but I like Laura and I've asked Laura to work with us um, and she handles the majority of the content writing that we do and the reason why I picked her it's not because of you know degrees or you know I didn't read her LinkedIn profile profile and you know commit it to memory and little flashcards and all of that um, you know it, it really was I went and read what she wrote and I liked the way she phrased I liked the way that she um, was able to capture information how she told stories I liked that you know I, I we have some kind they're not proprietary but they're kind of secret um, <laughs> ways of looking at blogs and whatnot and seeing how people are responding to them you know are they are you know it's it's not everything is not built based on clicks, but I but it is important. I do want to see that what she writes does attract traffic, um, that she does have a following, that you know that, that she is practicing what she preaches in terms of being a content writer. So those are the types of things that I found important when I was looking for somebody to help with our content writing and why I chose Laura because I think she's really really good at that um, and I would recommend if anybody else is considering you know picking up someone that does content um, that you want to that you want to consider those things um, you know my style is a little bit different most of the people on my team actually have I've met here on Google Plus um, you know we've, we've been able they're they're all frienders of mine at this point um, and and so I, I get a better feel for the people I work that work with my company through that angle but I'll let Laura talk about perhaps what other things you, you should be looking for when picking out a content writer well, thanks, Carmen. I thought I was getting all this work just because I was so darn hot. <laughs> that too. That never hurt. <laughs> no, yeah. and you know, but this I see. I have. I'm. I'm fortunate. I have an advantage um, over a lot of content writers, and that is, I have years of experience in business and sales before I ever started content writing. So it gives you a different mindset. I'm able to look at both the clients point of view and also the customers and I've handled marketing for so many businesses that uh, I've been involved in that it, it gives me a different you know a different skill set than a lot of content writers have to address this question as far as what you would look for in a content writer is exactly what Carmen says go back and look at what they have uh, uh, written on their website or any other content that's going to give you the best idea and it's not necessarily the articles that they're going to send you out, you know, send out to you as their spec articles. Mm -hmm. um, check out their social media profiles and see how they're communicating, how they're driving their own content, if they are at all. You know, it's kind of hard to say you're a content writer if you're not, if you don't have your own content platform. Um, just look at the different things that they're doing and talk to them. If they are good at communicating to you on the phone or on video or um, however you're communicating, they're probably good at communicating on paper. Well, and I think one thing that, that is also helpful, um, and you kind of touched on it, is, you know, are they aligned well with what your content will mm -hmm. be about? You know, we have a client, um, you know, they're, they're registered dietitians, and it's, it's tricky to write content for that because, um, you know, that's such a, it's not prescriptive, but you have to be very right. exact about it um, because yep. there's liability issues in, involved in what you release um, so you know for the content for that we you know I we're very careful about what we pick and what we say and how we say it um, and it really takes a you know a person if you're not in that industry which I would you know I would say that's probably the first option would be if you know for example if you're writing in an industry if your your business is in an industry that's highly regulated or something like that you want to look for a content writer that's experienced in that industry um, you know that's usually a very helpful thing and it doesn't necessarily mean that they worked in that industry but they've at least got other clients right. in that industry 
Right. Um, that can be very, very helpful in terms of trying to make sure that you um, have content that at the very least isn't going to get you in trouble. <laughs> and, and two, give them a chance. I mean, if you have something you're specifically looking for, um, use that as the spec page, spec piece. I mean, some writers will agree. I have many times, not all the time. It depends on who I'm dealing with. To go ahead and write something up for them, and that way they get a feel for you, and you get a feel for them. And that has led to some really wonderful clients that I have, and it has led to me letting a couple of clients go because they could really it was a communication thing. Either they weren't communicating well what they wanted, or I just couldn't understand it. Right. You know, not every fits perfect. You have to understand as a content writer, and there are there. Are, okay, now let's get into this. There are content writers that write by volume, so they put out you know X amount of pieces a day at five ten dollars a piece, and that's how they make their business. I don't do that. I, I'm definitely not a volume person. I I do good quality work. And I get paid for the quality. So you have to look at that as a content writer. What do you look at? Do you want somebody who's going to put out a gazillion pieces for you that are mediocre? Or do you want somebody who's going to put out better content that actually communicates your message? You know, Good. yeah, I, one, one more thing. I'm sorry. Um, there's a, we all know that there's these content mills that are um, overseas and they have English as a second language and it shows up in their writing. Are they right? It's just it, it's ridiculous. I saw one recently that was for a plastic surgeon's office, and you could tell this person hardly even knew what plastic surgery was, much less they were talking about liposuction. What liposuction is? It was a, <laughs> one of the. I wish I had saved it, but I was so irritated I clicked away from it. Now I can't remember how to go back because I tried the other night. Because I wish I had saved that because it's a good example of no, stop it. Don't do that. <laughs> Hashtag stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. Okay. We got just a little bit less than 10 minutes, and I want to make sure that we talk about your new HOA. So um, let's talk about that. Tell us about it. What are you going to be talking okay. about tonight? This, and actually this might be a good um, idea for David, this HOA is for the business of writing. There's all kinds of writers groups that you can get involved in in your community to help you with writing, for critiquing, um, you know, editing or whatever. But I have really not seen much that addresses the business of writing. I have gone through websites, uh, blog posts, and they all are do these five different things and it'll improve your writing. That's not what I'm talking about. I want the business of writing how to get the writing done, how to get it published, how to self-publish, how to market um, crowdfunding, which I just think is an amazing thing for writers, um, taxes, legal issues, anything that we can cover that has to do with the business of writing, that's what I want to cover. Because it's, uh, it's, it's like cooking. A great, great cook may think, you know what, I love to cook, I'm going to go buy a restaurant. And they go and buy this restaurant, and their food is incredible, but they don't know a thing about running that business. So they end up failing. It's the same with writers. You have to really understand what your business is about. You have to understand what you're capable of doing and when you're not capable of it, how to hire the people that can get it done for you. And that's what, that's really, that's what the show is going to be about. And um, I think that it's going to do a good service. It is not for me to sell a product or you know, to toot my own horn. It really, it, if it does, if it's not providing value to writers, I'm not going to do it. It's that simple. That's great. So, are you, is this going to be kind of a of a show where you have guests lined up, or are you? Um, is it okay? Um, yep. But yeah, that's. I mean, of course, I'd like to have guests, but of course, there'll be some times where we just have like an open discussion of things. Like tonight's show, Charlotte Pierce from Pierce Press is going to be on, and we're going to discuss. Um, the main problems that we have seen that writers do have in their businesses. And it's kind of just a kickoff show. Uh, we want people to come in and um, hopefully ask questions, tell us what they would like to see on future shows, and start building that community. And the whole thing is, uh, my intention for it is to be, it's a community group of writers. So I'm going to start a Google Plus community and also a LinkedIn community specifically for this show. Because okay. there's times, you know, let's say in the middle of the week, um, 
well, my show is on the middle of the week. But let's say on a Saturday night, you're in the middle of trying to do something and you need a resource or a tool or something, you don't know what to do. There needs to be a place people can go and ask that question so we can take care of needs right away and all work together. Because the best way to get anything done in today's marketplace of any business is to collaborate with others and to build good relationships. And that's how you're going to move forward. Excellent. That is, I, I could not agree more. I think um, that's one of the nice things, one of the, the greatest things about the internet and also about Google Plus is the ability to, Absolutely. is to link up with other people that are like-minded and then you become much more of a force, you know, as a collective than you do um, in singular. So I, I definitely would agree. Absolutely. I mean, that's, a, you know, we've talked about it dozens of times that it, it is such a powerful um place to be as an entrepreneur and as somebody who is uh, you know just trying to make it in the world and you know I work by myself I'm, I'm in the process of kind of I, I'm gonna have to hire somebody but I work for myself I wouldn't be able to do that if I did not have the support of the Google Plus community and the advice that I have received from people within the Google Plus community helped me grow my business and help me figure out how to get things done that I needed to get done so that's great, and I and I and I know definitely. You know, this it's it's funny because as an entrepreneur, you know, the first time I, this is the second business I've owned, um, and the first time you think you've got this great idea and it's just going to be awesome, and you're going to defy all the odds, and you're going to have a success the first time out, and it rarely ever works. Mm -hmm. The second time, I'm definitely wiser. Right. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. And, and I think, um, you know, being here and being active in Google+, Plus, you know, it's funny because my husband is like, I don't understand why you're on there all day. And I'm like, because I get things done. I meet people. I've, I've connected with yourself and other people here um, that have added tremendous value to my business. Um, and when you're adding value to my business, you're adding value to my life and to my family. And, you know, I thank you and, and the other people that are working with us over at Rojas Consulting from the bottom of my heart um, for what they bring to my business, and that certainly wouldn't be possible without Google Plus. So. I, have, I absolutely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. So it's, I, um, it's definitely opened up a lot of doors. Yep. Do you have any other um, shout outs or call to actions that you want to leave? We're nearing the end of the I, show here. I do. Um, I'm also co host on another show with Charlotte Pierce from Pierce Press called um, Indie Office Hours. It's uh, sponsored by the Independent Publishers of New England. And we cover our topics for authors. It may be tools or resources, um, ideas uh, that can help further their um, their business of writing, also, and um, get them to understand the publishing, self-publishing uh, space a little better. So I I do that, and that's on uh, Tuesdays at noon, where my show is tonight at 7:30. So if you uh, go to the link and click on it, it'll go right into your Google Calendar, and I hope to see you there. But um. Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, keep your options open, and when you're writing content, like I said, just really write it like something you want to read, something that would be valuable to you. It's going to be valuable to somebody else, and try try to keep that, you know, it doesn't have to be all dry and, um, you know, sell, sell, sell. That's, that's not content that's going to work for you. Yep, and absolutely, Kevin. I just saw your comment. We will be posting links. Um, you know that that's that's what we do. Um, you know, so we'll make sure, Laura, to post links to your yep. show, and feel free to invite everybody. Um, you know, post a link to the invitation oh, well. here um, in the comment thread. I, w I would um, invite you to do that so that you can go check out Laura at Laura's show. Um, so I will take the last few minutes to just kind of give everybody an update and a preview on what's coming up next. Um, I next. Next week's show is a show that I have been looking forward to for a really long time, and I think Laura would be willing to tell you I've been talking to her about this for like a month now. But we have been able to round up some of my favorite HOA hosts um, all into one show. So we will be talking with um, Jason Weiser, who has recently returned to um, the dark side of being an <laughs> HOA host. We're also going to have on um, one of my good friends, Dennis Deuce, who will be joining that show. Um, also, Sandra Watson with the ABCs of Google Plus will be joining us. Um, a great guy, and, and, I, and I'm really glad that he's going to be able to join us, is Ryan Hanley, who I mentioned. He will be joining us um, also. And last but certainly not least, definitely not least, 
Mia Voss will be joining us yep. on the Camel Jacket Chat next week. We are going to have a special time, so please make note of that when you see the invitation come out, that it, it will not be at our regular 1 p.m. Um, we had some conflicts, and so we decided, you know what, it's more important that we get everybody rather than it be at my magical time. So, <laughs> so we are going to be doing it in the evenings. I think it's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, awesome. is, the, is the time that we picked. So the point of that show, we're going to talk about what to expect when you're hosting. Um, so, you know, we wanted to bring on some of these people, and they're not, it's not to say that I don't like other hosts that are not on the show. It was just these were the ones that, hey, came up, they were able to make it, um, and, and so we grabbed them. So all you other hosts out there, don't fret. We will be coming back for you. We will be asking you to come on. We've had Eric Enga on already. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely circling the groups and, and trying to get other people on, on the show. So that's next week. Make sure you watch out for the invitation. We will be posting that by the end of the day today. So make sure that you look for that and um, click yes because you definitely don't want to miss <laughs> that show. <laughs> I have to give a quick shout out to Ryan Hanley. I saw right before I came on the show, I saw a post where he has met, or I got an email from him actually, where he has met 42% of his goal for his crowdfunding for his new book. And okay. that was three days. Which he's so deserving. He's one of my absolute favorites. I've been listening to his him podcast before he ever even came on to Google Plus. I love Ryan Hanley. He is awesome. Well, so if anybody has a chance, check him out. Check him out. He's worth I mean, he always gives something of value. Everything he does. Yeah, so we're we're looking forward to having him and Mia and Jason and Dennis and Sandra and somewhere I'll fit in. That's going to be great. Yeah, that's <laughs> going to be great. I can't wait. That's going to be so much fun. I, I hope so. I hope so. And, you know, after that, we, we've got more and more good stuff. As I mentioned, um, you know, we're going to have Mike Alton will come back. We're also going to be um, speaking with Jason Frasca later on this summer. Um, we were able to book a date with Susan Finch and some others. Uh, so we are going to be having some awesome, awesome shows. So make sure that you pay attention. Look out for the invitations. Um, and we will be seeing you guys next time on the Camel Jacket Chat. Have a good day. You just got photobombed. <laughs> I, I know. I, if it's the dog or the daughter. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>